The Byzantine sect of the Camarilla may extend their hand to all kindred who wish to become a member, but while the threshold for entry is low, the expectations and regulations that come with the membership can sometimes make young neonates wish they had never bent their knee to the prince of the city. Like it or not, anyone looking for influence in the small, exclusive club of their city's Camarilla needs to learn to play the game, and the best place to do that is at the local Elysium. Every city has their own traditions for how, when and where the Elysium is held. In some it might be once a week, your typical get-together with mingling and champagne glasses filled with vitae, while in others it could be once a year, or even less, serving more as a token gesture of ceasefire between elders otherwise busy with their jihad scheming. Debates, lectures, art expositions, the VIP floor of a popular nightclub, any of these could serve as Elysium, as long as security is guaranteed and that any unfortunate kind who might stumble upon it are dealt with discreetly. An Elysium can only be declared by the prince of a city, and certain rules apply in there where they don't otherwise. Violence is strictly prohibited and Elysium is neutral grounds, at least in theory, meaning that it is one of the few places a neonate could confront an elder about a grievance and have them hear them out. Wanton destruction, specifically of art, is often also forbidden, which is a general rule put in place due to the many art museums and exhibitions that tend to host these events. Finally, the masquerade must still be observed and respected. And while kindred are free to meet in other places, these additional rules make Elysium a more attractive gathering place. In some cities, especially those where the prince has a particular interest in the day-to-day -day of their domain, you can expect a high attendance, while in others it might just be the same four to our door awkwardly shuffling around and whiling away the hours. Often, whenever someone mentions Elysium, the Clan of the Rose comes to mind, and this is natural given their penchant for social gatherings, but the degenerates often shy away from the responsibility of being keeper, unless they happen to be the type who much more enjoy running the show rather than being the showstopper. Since it can be considered a bit of a backhanded gift to be made Keeper of Elysium, what with all the requirements and expectations suddenly thrown at you, the role is often filled by someone who either resents the job or who is utterly passionate about it. To avoid making a fool of themselves, kindred visiting Elysium need learn the power structure of their own city. Certain title holders like the Prince would be known by all kindred, except perhaps the most foolish, but others not so much. To a bruja with anarch leanings, learning to identify the sheriff and their hounds would be of top priority, while a torador debutante would be caught dead before forgetting the face of one of the city's harpies. But when the same torador accidentally gets caught embracing without permission, or the bruja decides to make a move for position as primogen, they will come to regret their ignorance. By now we have a fairly good idea what a prince does. Their domain and responsibility is the city and all that goes on within its limits, and they often act as arbiter between kindred. How involved in politics they get is up to each prince, but they are regularly aided in their work by a seneschal. The seneschal handles much of the day-to-day -day business, meaning they tend to be embraced and employed more for their managerial skills rather than raw power. In some cities, the prince may be so old or uninterested in earthly matters that the seneschal is in charge of all of their vast assets, while in others they're little more than an errand boy to the prince's whims. The primogen are the other major power of a city. Strictly speaking, a council of elders who advise the prince, although what exactly advice means in this case is debatable, the primogen are supposed to be the counterweight in much of the city's nightly politics. Praxis is that they are each a representative of their clan, a spokesperson if you will, but what that entails is nebulous and ill-defined. There are not even any codified rules as to how one becomes the primogen, it is a position taken by those who can hold it, at least until someone else usurps them. Some clans, like the Tremere, may simply default to the head of the local chantry, as they are the de facto leader, while others might hold votes amongst their members to see who has the support. Others are constantly at each other's throat, the position held only by those who can outmaneuver the others of the clan. Some councils are open for any to take the numbered seats, and some even offer non-Camarilla clans a seat at the table should they have a presence in the city. They have no dictator responsibilities, no official higher authority to defer to. It is a position very much defined by its occupant and the political climate of the city playing host. Some primogen do get involved in the nightly affairs of their clan members, trusting that this will earn them recognition and respect amongst their lessers. Few make it to this position without at least some understanding of the long play. And finally, while it is not unheard of, it is unusual for a prince to also have the position of primogen, especially since the other members may find this highly inappropriate. I will do a more extensive video on the primogen in the future, as they are too complex a phenomena to entirely cover in this video. Harpies fill an interesting niche in the vampire ecology. 
one can never be made a harpy, one simply is. They are the trendsetters, the vox populi, the mean girls. Anyone can be one if they have the talent for it. A razor sharp wit, a good memory, and the ability to sway others with your words. Your stereotypical harpy may be a toreador, and most often are, but consider if you will the storied court jesters, one of the few permitted to speak freely and who, with their scalding satire and thinly veiled criticism of the gathered lords and ladies, may well be a template for the sharp-eyed Malkavian or Nosferatu under the guise of delusion or of bestial ignorance. Formerly the harpies are the record keepers of prestations, the trading of favors and boons between kindred. Given enough time, money begins to lose its meaning to many elders, but favors owed are always relevant. The harpies, then, are those who oversee the right of prestation and who expose oathbreakers so that none may escape the scalding judgment of their peers. If you are worried that the other party may not return the favor they owe you, it is always safest to ensure that the harpies know of it. With their ability to influence public opinion, any kindred would do well not to get on the harpies' bad side as long as their ambition is to rise in rank within the ivory tower. Ironically, those less at home in the salons of the Elysium tend to also have less to fear from the harpies. A gangrel who happens to stumble into Elysium have less expectations put on them than the fledgling child of an influential ventru whose every move will be closely monitored. The sheriff and their hounds are the prince's police. Their job is to make sure that the traditions are followed and, more and more often these nights, that the population of caitiffs, the clanless, and thinbloods don't become a problem, using lethal means if necessary. However, the sheriff is no judge dread, judge, jury, and executioner, but rather the extension of the prince's authority in their domain. The role of weeding out thinbloods might also be given to a scourge, a relatively newly reinstated rank in the Camarilla with a more single-minded purpose that of destroying one of the prophesied signs of Gehenna. Only the prince may nominate a sheriff, but the sheriff may in turn recruit their own aides, called hounds. Sometimes a particularly powerful or popular sheriff may even be saddled with them by the prince themselves, who want to ensure that they don't get too big for their britches. Both the sheriff and their hounds are given a modicum of leeway when it comes to the traditions, but clear breaches may require justification. Most newly embraced kindred whose sires have left them or are otherwise absent will inevitably run into the city's sheriff and their enforcers. If they're lucky, they'll be taken to the prince for an introduction. If they're not, the best thing they can hope for is being run out of town. Some sheriffs might even feign sympathy and kindness, knowing that the fledglings will in turn feel indebted to them. The whip serves much like its political namesake. Their job is to create a unified front in their clan, ensuring that there aren't any dissenters in important matters. Often quite charismatic, or otherwise influential, these kindred don't find much power in the position itself, but if they work closely with the primogen, there may be some more weight behind their words. They are the ones who know all members of a clan in the city and where to find them, more or less. The Herald, should there be one, serves as the prince's voice, publicly declaring whatever edicts the ruler has decided on. They may also act as an announcer at Elysium, calling out the titles of new arrivals. It is a role that can sometimes be assigned the city's harpies should the herald otherwise not be needed. In some cities, an edict is not valid until the herald has declared it, which gives them a much more important role than where this is not the custom. There are a few other titles as well, but these generally operate on a much grander scale than city limits, meaning it is a rare thing for any newly embraced to meet them. So we will leave them for a future episode. In my next episode, we'll talk a bit about ghouls, the still-living servants of kindred bound by loyalty and forced through blood. Until then, thank you for listening, and be careful out there. For Gehenna may soon be upon us.